let's get started good morning everyone to the second day of set smt school so today we are going to have one tutorial uh, followed by two talks and it's my great pleasure to introduce um, today's speaker uh, a close collaborator and a good friend dr mate sus mate obtained his masters in budapest university of technology and economics in it security and wrote his phd and Indriya Grenaug on privacy preserving RFIDs. Well, fortunately for us, at that time he started writing the set solver crypto mini set, and that was a decade ago. I went through the list of solvers in top five for the past decade, and it's clear from the list that Mate belongs to this coveted group of about 10 people in the world who have built a solver from scratch and keep up with all the developments for over a decade. Of course, Mate does not just keep up with the developments, but has been leader in developing a solver that is versatile and has won um, set race in 2010, won incremental track of set competition in 2015 and 2016. Furthermore, the solver that Mate uh, writes, Crypto Mini Set, performs tasks that are beyond CDCL solvers. And closer to my heart is Crypto Minister's ability to support Gaussian elimination, which has been uh, very crucial for the existence of hashing-based techniques. Mate is also the lead maintainer of STP, that has again won several medals in SMT competition over the years. And he also maintains Approximacy, the tool for model counting. So uh, we could not think of a better uh, speaker to give us uh, all about CDCL, set solving, and beyond CDCL. So let's welcome Mate Sus, and uh, we look forward to the tutorial from him. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mate. Uh, I have to admit, I have a bit of a jet lag, so uh, <laughs> please forgive me for uh, any uh, slight uh, missteps. Hopefully, it will be fine. So I'm going to talk about SAS solving and CDCLT. Actually, I'm going to cut it into exactly two parts. So there is this session, which is going to be more about SAT solving in general. And then we'll dig into CDCLT in the next session. And in the final session, we're going to have a, um, a practical sort of uh, thing that hopefully will bring all of this together into one sort of coherent picture where you can actually play with all of these things on your laptops uh, using Python, which is basically the easiest way that I could think of to make this comprehensible and also you know, like writable by anyone in this room because Python is a relatively uniform language in the sense that um, most people can, can program it in, uh, in that. Uh, you have to take into account that most, most SAT solvers that are, that are uh, winning the competition are written in, in C, C++, but they are like, actually what the most deployed uh, SAT solver happens to be written in Java, which you will uh, hear about later or well, at least the, from author of which you'll hear about later, called Set4J. Uh, and I didn't want you to push, to, uh, push you to, uh, to write C++ code because it's uh, very, very cumbersome, as you might know. So I wrote these slides with the help, uh, with the help from, from, uh, from Armin, uh, Armin Bierre, who is, uh, if you know Sat, you must have uh, seen some of his papers at least. Um, who generously donated some of these slides. Um, I will tell you when we switch over to my set of slides. I mean, a good chunk of it has been edited and uh, uh, rearranged for this session, obviously. Um, but all the CDCLT is written by me, and then uh, some of the SAT solving I took from Armin, because he is one of the lead SAT developers. Um, and I will be actually talking about some of his code as well, because uh, his solver, uh, beyond being one of the best, is actually one of the most comprehensible as well, which is uh, quite an achievement, actually, uh, especially if you look at some of the soft solvers uh, that are winning nowadays that are incomprehensible, including mine, actually. So with that out of the way, let's start with uh, some introductions. Uh, so we're going to be uh, stuck with each other for four and a half hours, which is quite a long while. Uh, so I think we should do, uh, it's kind of a relationship we're going to have. And um, I, I think we should, uh, we should try to do some introductions of each other. So I'm going to start, and then you can, you can follow up. Uh, so as, as mentioned by Kuldeep, thank you so much. I finished my PhD at INRIA in Grenoble. 
um, and I did it in uh, security and privacy. And uh, I am the maintainer of CryptoMinisa, STP, ProxMC, so a few tools related to SAT solving and CDCLT. Um, and um, I actually work uh, as a senior research fellow at uh, National University of Singapore with Kuldeep uh, about three months a year nowadays and nine months a year, so the majority of my time actually. Uh, I work at a company called Zalando, which is the largest online retail store uh, for fashion in all of Europe with like some eight billion turnover. We just made over a billion last week because it was the cyber week. I don't know if you know, like this uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, it's a very American sort of tradition that has been introduced to Europe. So in a single week, we managed to make a billion euros of turnover, um, and I do security there. So uh, uh, if you blindfold me and strap me to a chair, I will have to, uh, I can also do a <laughs> IT security presentation if I really have to. Um, but I very much enjoy doing SAP solving. So that's kind of, used to be my hobby, and now I actually, uh, thanks to Kudip, I'm actually, uh, I have a framework to doing it. And I like doing a lot of different things in SAP solving. I, I, of course, uh, CDCL and CDCLT are very interesting, but I like other stuff too. I, I work in machine learning, visualization, uh, counting, and higher level abstractions. That's sort of CDCLT and other things you'll see. Uh, because I think they're fun. And now it's up to you. So let's say, I'm kind of curious, who works in industry here? So by industry, I mean uh, not strictly only in academia. Uh, consulting, uh, just you know, writing code, um, any kind of data, data engineering, data science, that sort of stuff for any company. Okay, so there's quite a few. Um, how about uh, who is like who considers themselves to be a student? That could also be a professor. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, okay, that's cool. And who are the people who work like professionally in academia? Um, okay, and and who are the people? I, I would I would I used to call myself hobbyist, which was a very interesting um, combination of uh, neither in academia nor in the industry. So, is there anyone who like considers themselves this is kind of a fun thing they do? This is like, they're interested in, but it's not something that they actually get paid for doing, uh, SAT solving or or any of these uh, SMT, let's say, or verification that sort of stuff. Okay, there are a few. That's good. That's good. Yes. All right. So we did a little bit of introductions. I think that's uh, good to know who is sitting here. Yes. So basically, I'm going to start with this, uh, with this slide, which is quite a, uh, a funny one. But the point is that um, it sort of introduces uh, propositional logic, where you have variables, in this case, uh, shirt and jewelry. Well, clearly, I'm not wearing a shirt, but I am wearing jewelry. And you have all these different single symbols like disjunction, conjunction, and negation. So these are like the basic symbols that you need, uh, plus the variables. And then if a variable, is, is, so that from the variable we can also derive literals. And a literal is basically either just a variable on its own or it is the negation of a variable. So if you have a look at the right hand side there, then you see not jury or shirt, jury or shirt, not jury or not shirt. So these are different ways of of, of talking about whether a speaker is you know, wearing one or the other. And the idea is that you're supposed to wear either one or the other. Otherwise, it's kind of impolite. Um, so most, uh, the formulas that I'll be talking about will be looking like this. So this is uh, what's called conjunctive normal form, where you have a disjunction of literals is called a close. And then a conjunction of clauses is called uh, a conjunctive normal form. And of course, we can express NP-complete problems in this. And here, the variables were just jury and shirt, but of course, you can have any number of variables and up to millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions. We can solve them. It's not the number of variables that matter. So just actually, on that note, I'll just to take a segue a little bit. Uh, most people think the number of variables is going to make a big difference. Um, it turns out that you can generate or create uh, problems in a few hundred variable range that no SAT solver currently can solve. And, and maybe in just under a thousand variables that if you can actually solve, you can definitely get a couple of million, maybe a couple of hundred million euros for it. Um, and nobody can solve it. And yet, at the same time, 
Most industrial problems contain well over 100,000 variables and we can easily solve them. So it's not the number of variables that matters, it's the underlying hardness of the problem. If you take a cryptographic problem that is supposed to be hard, of course, and that's what I was talking about when I said under 1,000 variables, so let's say AES, uh, it will be extremely hard to solve because, of course, if you can solve AES, you know, there will be people out there who will pay you at least 100 million without a, without a blink of an eye. The problem is that we can't solve them, obviously, with any tool, including Satsop. Uh, whereas at the same time, you know, easy problems translated to this large number of variables, the Satsop will easily be able to solve. So this is the, this is the trip that most people trip into when they start doing SAT solving and they start asking like, how about, you know, I have 2,000 variables, will it work? I'm like, I don't know. Is it 2,000 variables about, you know, like reversing a AES? Then the answer is no. <laughs> if if 2,000 variables comes from like some simple, you know, scheduling problem, then the answer is yes. So the underlying complexity of the problem will make the difference, not the number of variables. So we can look broadly at SAT solving. Um, of course, it's a bubble of its own, but Within this bubble, you can look at uh, SAT solving as a way of encoding the problem into this CNF notation that I just introduced. Uh, that's called uh, the encoding part, right at the top. And then you simplify this encoding uh, using some techniques. Uh, I might have some time to talk about some of these techniques. And then you do some form of search on the simplified CNF. And then if you're really good, then what you do is that you actually do something called in-processing, where you um, go back to the simplifying step, and you actually re-simplify your, your formula once you have done some search. And if you're even better, like Armin or some of the more advanced solvers, like Kadikal or CryptoMinisat, um, probably also set for j is that you, you can actually do re-encoding. So that means that you actually go back to the original, for, uh, or try to go back to the original um, formulation from the CNF, and then, and then re-encode the things that you find there. Uh, they typically do this, for example, for cardinality constraints, where the cardinality constraint was encoded wrongly. So what you do is that you recover the encoding, you, um, you throw away everything that was the old encoding, and you re-encode it. And it turns out that you're going to be faster. So this is, this is where we are normally at in a, in a modern, modern set solver. Uh, but in this talk, we'll talk mostly about search. That's, for, that's why it's so uh, in, in large letters. Um, but we'll, we'll mention simplifying and maybe even re-encoding when we talk about CDCRT later in the talk. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what SAS servers are useful for. I'm, I'm, there's been some talks already, so I'm not going to go into detail, especially not about origin, like C, plot, C code, because it's not something that everybody understands necessarily. But one thing that we could do uh, with SAS solving is trying to check optimizations. I don't know if you've heard about this. There's, a, there's actually a really interesting tool that does this for LLVM uh, IR, which is this intermediate representation that LLVM uses. And then you can, um, you, can, you, can, you can call something called super, which actually uses uh, an underlying SAT solver. I think it actually uses Z3. Well, it's a, that's an SMT solver, but of course it has a SAT solver underneath it, um, to do uh, optimization on LVMIR. And it actually just checks if the optimized version is, is, is equivalent than the other one. So it does this equivalence checking. That is to say, you know, there's an unoptimized code, there's an optimized code, and then it does, hey, is the two equivalent? Of course, for this, you actually need to understand the underlying syntax, right? And you need to understand what all those things do. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. And in the, in the LLVMIR case, you actually need to be able to parse LLVMIR and understand each and every line of code that uh, LLVMIR can output. And what does it mean? What, is the, what, it, what, what does it mean that you increment a variable? And we can, and, and a lot of these, uh, a lot of these equivalence checkings um, can be, let's say, translated down to uh, this, using this Tayson transformation, which is effectively a form of uh, electrical circuit. Um, so if you look at the left, it's, a, it's truly an electrical circuit, but of course you can make the left-hand side this electrical circuit out of the code that we just saw. And, and then you make this, um, let's say higher level description on the right, you see that, for example, the output O is an XOR of Y and W, so that's the, uh, so right here, so you see this, this, this thing here is this here, and then, um, I don't know, for example, the output V here is, is, uh, is B or C, you see here, B or C, etc. 
So this is sort of a higher level description of what's here, right? And then you can sort of what we call blasting down. So we, we, we encode these constraints into a more refined constraint here, which is just saying x implies a and x implies c. Obviously, this in x means x implies a and x implies c. And also, a and c implies x, right? So, and, and from here, we can go down to the actual CNF here, which is the same if you think about it. It's just that it's expressed in this more, uh, let's say, uh, expanded format, but at the same time, it is a very specific, uh, it's a normal form. So it's, it uses only uh, uh, a disjunction of literals here and conjuncted all together. So about that, right? So how many different things can we express? Well, there's lots we can express. I'm just going to talk a few, right? So there's the negation, which is quite obvious. There's the disjunction, like x implies Y or Z, you make this out of it. This is a, this is a, a standard encoding of this, of this formula that you see on the left. And then this conjunction, of course, as well, which is more or less the same, except everything is inverted. And now there's also if, if then else gate. I mean, I'm not going to go into details, but you can read through this uh, quite easily. Uh, it's basic. the C is going to select which of the ones we're going we're gonna to take, which of the two inputs we're going to take. And then you can, you, can, you can translate it down into this. And what's interesting here is that now we start bumping into one, what's something what, what's called R consistency, which is um, R consistency means that if I set some of these, these value, variables, right? So these are, these are, these are all these, these, these input variables here. And if I start setting them, it might or might not force certain other variables to be a certain value. And the encoding sometimes doesn't actually express that. So the encoding can, can be lazy in the sense that it's not R consistent, which means that some of the, if, if I set some of the variables which are clearly inconsistent, it will actually not fail. It will not give me the empty, the empty close when I sub substitute all the variables inside there. Um, but R consistency is expensive in the sense that it means that we have to write now more clauses to express the same underlying expression. For example, negation. I mean, negation is obvious, but some other more higher level descriptions, for example, this if then else, uh, this if then else a gate, uh, you start needing to write additional clauses, the ones here actually, these, these two clauses. If I don't add these two clauses, then this thing will not be R consistent. So this is still true. This is still correct. But it's not R consistent in the sense that some of the combination of the variables, if I substitute them in, will actually not give me an empty close. It will not, not fail. Even though it is a failure, it is incorrect. So if you start substituting in and then you start evaluating it, you realize that it is not a possible combination. Yet this set of clauses will not tell you that immediately. You would have to do a search on it. And so here comes this kind of trade-off, do you want this thing to be R consistent and so every time fail when I put in the variables that are inconsistent or do you, do you want this to be fast because I can substitute the variables in very quickly because I don't have to add these two extra closes. And a lot of sort of the, 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 the trade-off or this issue, yes? So the clause has to be Yes, so the question is, uh, um, does our consistency mean in this case that uh, if we substitute the variables in that are actually an, an inconsistent set of uh, assignments, will it derive the uh, empty close? Is that the, the definition of our consistency? And that is the definition, yeah, that's correct. And it is also correct that we, with search, you will derive the empty close, but now you have to do search. It's not good enough for you to substitute the variables in. So for example, this one here, will not derive the empty close if t is 0, e is 0, and x is equal to 1. Because if t is 0, and x, so the, the, it, will, it will not derive that, 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 that close is not in here, yet that is not a, not a consistent uh, setting for this, for this gate. You would have to derive that through search. And this, this trade-off happens quite often, especially with more complicated constraints, that the moment you start having R consistencies, the moment you will have to have many, many, many more uh, closes in order to, to enforce this R consistency. And instead, 
a lot of uh, modern SAS servers do is that they actually derive these, um, what we can call redundant constraints, because I can remove them and the CNF still means exactly the same thing as it did before. Because I can, I can derive this constraint from these constraints through search and, and, and resolution. And the new SAS servers will actually derive them uh, using this in-processing te technique that, that is here. So they will derive these uh, through this and sometimes through this, depending which one, uh, which one we're going to ch choose. And I'm going to talk about XOR constraints, but not be only because I have a thing for them. It's also because we, uh, we use them quite often in doing uh, counting and uh, sampling. And what's interesting here is that this is a very simple constraint, right? A plus a, a, a X or B is equal to 1, or a, a, in, let's say L1, X or 2, X or 3 is equal to 1, etc. But as you see, the number of the length of this very simple constraint, if you think about it, it's an extremely simple constraint, right? I mean, all you have to do is, is a parity constraint, right? So if, I, if everything is 0 here, this is not going to be OK, right? There's at least one of them needs to be a 1. Uh, but, or, you know, three of them needs to be a 1. That's also OK. Um, so this is a very simple constraint, but if you have a look at the, the straight translation of this constraint, it starts growing, and actually it does grow as you would expect. So you know, like two, four, eight, sixteen, etc. So this is exponential. So that's not going to work. So you will need to introduce new variables, otherwise you'll have end up with exponential number of closes to express this super simple constraint. And so what you do is that you, of course, add uh, helper variables. So what you do is that you add two helper variables, in this case actually three helper variables, to, um, to cut this constraint into three chunks. So now it's like L, you know, L1, L2, L3 helper variable, helper variable L4, L5 helper variable, helper variable L6, L7. If you add this all together in XOR, of course, all the helper variables drop out and you get back to this constraint, right? But you add the three helper variables. So we needed extra variables to extract it, to, to, to express this very simple constraint. So if you work in the, in, in polynomial fields or in, in, in GF2 and, and you work with polynomials, then you, you know, this is, this is something that is, uh, you know, like one of the simplest equation that you can write basically. And it's going to take you exponential number of closes to do without helper variables. So you will need helper variables. And this is one of the places where people start asking like, you know, like how many helper variables, helper variables should I add? You know, like the number of variables is supposed to like determine the, the complexity of the problem. And this is, this is, this goes back to the original discussion that I had at the beginning in that the number of variables doesn't matter. It's the underlying problem that matters. So don't worry about adding variables. We actually add thousands of variables every time we add uh, new XORs and we don't care. I don't even count. That's not what matters. What matters is the, uh, in the underlying complexity of the, pro of, the, of the problem that you put in. And the, 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 the reasoning engine's maybe power to, 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 to work with that uh, particular set of constraints that are in there. So this, this thing actually is called the cut, cutting number. You see that I cut it into at most four uh, length closes. So this is called the cutting number when it comes to XORs. Um, there are many, many other constraints with all their own parameters and their own parameter spaces and different kinds of uh, things you can write about, of course, our consistency, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here is the cutting number is quite easy. So you just cut it into chunks. You can, of course, cut it into five long chunks and six long chunks and seven long chunks. But if you cut it into 100 long chunks, you'll have a to the power of, I don't know, 99 long, uh, 99 causes for each and every one of them. So you probably want to cut it into shorter. Um, because of the exponential nature of, of course, we still need to translate each of these individually into a close. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about incarnating the constraints, although I'm, uh, we will actually play with this, which is kind of uh, a really uh, cool thing. And there's, there's someone in the audience I know who is uh, an expert in this, and should, I shouldn't be talking about this. It really ought to be him, because I'm sure he'll do a better, um, a better job. But basically, a cardinal constraint is we just now want to count how many of the literals in this constraint are, is assigned to true. And we, we, we upper bound this by a certain number. And it's called at most k. Right? So we want at most 10 or at most 5 of these literals to be true. And uh, like this, right? And uh, there are many, many different uh, encodings of cardinal constraints, and I will not go into it, but you will have the chance of actually implementing not uh, an encoding, but uh, a CDCLT solver, which um, basically just encodes the, uh, in, in Python, you encode all the different ways that a cardinal constraint can uh, perform a, con a conflict, so something is inconsistent, like detecting an inconsistency, and also doing a propagation where you're just just off of an inconsistency. If, if anything happens, you will be inconsistent, and you can detect this and then uh, perform actions to avoid uh, uh, 
getting into an inconsistency. So inconsistency in, in, in our case with what, what we call conflict, which is to say we're in a position and a set of assignments that we have made that are conflicting, they're not right, something is off. So that's, that's, uh, that's something that we, uh, we like to detect, for example, when it comes to cardinal constraints. And this again goes back to our consistency. So if you, if you have a cardinal constraint enc uh, encoding that is uh, are consistent, you will always detect if something is off. Like, it's an at most k constraint and you have k plus one set, you should always, that's, that you should always detect it. But another thing that you should detect is that if you have exactly k set, then of course everything else must be zero. All the other literals must be zero. If it's an at most constraint of three and you have ten literals and three of them already set to one, then you know that everything else must be set to zero, otherwise this thing will fail. And that's also part of our consistency where you may make sure that nothing can fail from now on. Now that we know that these are the three that are set out of these ten, the other seven must be zero. Right. And there are many, many uh, different encodings. And then one of, the, one of the ones that are really sort of interesting is the at most one constraint. Of course, I, I was talking about at most k constraint, which k is quite a, you know, a variable you can set to any value. But at most one is kind of interesting in, in many co places. And of course, encoding at, at most one is easier than encoding at most k because there's more, of course, there's more variance when it comes to at, at most k. All right. And now let's talk about the, the Dimex format, which is just a very simple format to, um, to, uh, to actually write CNF for uh, a SAT solver. So when you want to use a SAT solver, you need to use this, uh, uh, this, enco this, this, this uh, file format to, um, to describe what you want, to, uh, what you want to, uh, uh, the, the SAT solver to, to work on. And here, it usually has a .cnf as, a, as an extension. And here we have the header, which tells me that this is a CNF. And it's got two variables and three constraints. You see that there's three constraints and there's two variables, one and two. And we have the actual closes. So the, uh, each of these lines is a disjunction of literals, and each of these lines must be satisfied. So there is no, there is no line here that is unsatisfied if we get a, a solution. And this solution will satisfy all these constraints. Right, so minus one, two will satisfy this because mi minus one is set to one. Minus one, two will satisfy this because two is set, set to one. And minus one, two will satisfy this because two is set to one. So this, is, this must be read, this is the solution, and it must be read that the first variable is false and the second variable is true. And the zero at the end is just terminates the line. And this is, this is how it works here as well. So the, this is a literal that is uh, inverted. This is a, uh, I mean, this is a variable that's inverted. So it's a, it's, a, it's a literal with a negation. This is the literal on its own. And then the termination of the line. Some SAT solvers, you will see that they don't actually care about the header. And most SAT solvers can be instructed not to care about the header. In particular, Minisat doesn't care about the header. And most people actually don't put the header in, and then some SAT servers will crash uh, underneath them, and they're very surprised when that happens. But Minisat uh, is kind of special, and, and I actually, my SAT server obviously also doesn't, because it's built on Minisat, but also because people make this mistake all the time, and I don't want to like, bother them too much. But having the header is quite nice, because of course you can pre-allocate some data structures, etc. So you will see that if you put the header in, it, will, it sometimes works a lot faster. Um, and here, uh, this is just using PicoSat, which is a very, very small SAT solver uh, that is used all over the place because it's so tiny and it's uh, pure, written purely in C. And then the C lines that you see here, is, this is actually non-standard, but, but the C line means that it's, it's a comment. Um, and you can add comments to any, well, you know, at the end of any line or at any new line. Uh, in general, actually, you're not supposed to do this, uh, funnily enough. But, uh, since Armin does this, and I do this, and almost everybody does this, it's uh, more or less standard at this point that you can add uh, comments at the end of uh, closes. So this is, of course, saying not jury or shirt, jury or shirt, not jury or not shirt. OK. So if you want to use SAT solvers, then often uh, you will not be using them from the command line. Because if you use the command line, then you use this Dimex format that I just described. But often, you want, it, you want to use it as part of a larger whole. So it's very rare that SAT solver actually does your problem. You know, that's like your, your problem is SAT. Like, no, nobody, I mean, I, 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 I've yet to meet an industrial person who comes to me and says, I, my problem is SAT. <laughs> you know, their, their problem is scheduling. Their problem is, um, I don't know, routing. Their problem is um, all these kind of higher level problems. 
And then, you know, you as a consultant or a researcher or a hobbyist or whatever you, uh, you, you, you think yourself to be, you know, you come in and, and use this as a tool to, to fix their problem, right? And, and so you will want to use the SaaS software as part of your system. And for that, you need an API, so an application programming interface, where you can call this SAT solver over and over again with different problems, with you know, different encodings, with, with, uh, with some online problem, for example, if it's, a, if it's a, a routing or picking problem, like a picking problem is when people are in a warehouse and they go around a little cart and you know, they need to pick the new items for the, uh, for the new orders that come in. And, and Obviously, you need to run the SAT, the, the SAT server all the time because the new order is coming in and you're trying to like, optimize the, the, the routing schedule or the picking schedule, the way they pick the items from the, from the shelves. And, um, and for that, you need some kind of programmatic interface. And, and so this, this uh, uh, programmatic interface was basically created what's called IPASIR, IPASIR. Um, that is sort of a standard uh, interface for all SAT servers. So you can sort of just change the SAT server underneath and you don't realize that you have, you have changed it. Um, and this was mostly derived from uh, Minisat's original uh, API. And it has, of course, you can add closes. You can uh, call the SAT solver. You can also retract some closes. So you can remove some, some, some closes and say, OK, well, actually, that, that close I didn't want to add. Uh, to do that, you, um, you do something called push pop. So you can push and pop state. You can say, oh, well, you know, push the state. This is the, the, I want to remember this state, do some things. And then you can pop the state. You go back to the, pl the, the place you were before. This sometimes is important because you, you reach some point in your, in your search, which might be a higher level search, and you, you, you want to do some, some sub search, and then you want to go back to the original position and, and do some other work uh, below. Um, and we do this through this, what's called assumptions, which is to say that we can solve under, under assumptions. Um, so you can solve the, uh, the problem on its own, and then it will be at solved. But you can also say, let's solve this, but A is actually 0. And what's nice about that is that when you solve it and you get a solution, of course, A is going to be 0. But if you get a solution that says, no, this is unsatisfiable, you can say, ah, OK, well, then let's solve it A is equal to 1. Or let's solve it without any constraint. Uh, a can be any, either 0 or 1. So you can go back to the original um, uh, the original, the original uh, problem, which is nice because if under, under the assumption of A is equal to zero, it was unsatisfiable, you can never go back, of course, in a normal CNF setting because once it's, a problem is unsatisfiable, it's unsatisfiable. You know? <laughs> There's nothing you can do about it. But solving with uh, assumptions allows you to do this trick. And there are many, many uh, uh, systems, for example, our system for, uh, for solution counting and for, um, and for uh, sampling uses this uh, heavily. And you will see that a lot of uh, systems that use SAT solvers will use solving under assumptions heavily. Um, and this is the interface I'll just explain here in a, in a that's the model. So here is where, you know, you uh, uh, have the SAT solver, you know, add, add variables, whatnot. And then, then now it's like solving. And then if it's unset, like if the solving, you know, finishes with unsatisfiable, then you're unsatisfiable, bad luck. Um, and, but but if, you, if you solved under, under uh, assumptions, you can still go back and, and start again. And of course, this, sometimes it's unknown. You can also add um, a timeout or, or certain limits on you know, how much uh, time or resources you want to spend on trying to solve a, a particular problem. Uh, maybe this is actually a better one. So this is more like maybe easier to read than the previous slide, I would say. So here you see you initialize the thing, and then you add literals to it, and then you solve it, and then you can query if it's, if it's failed, and you can also, um, this is where you can add um, a, a termination criterion, for example, time or whatever you want to do. And here's a very simple one where you, this is C++, of course, here, but Ipashi actually, I think, has a Java interface as well. Does it? I'm wondering, does it have a Java interface? I think it does, yes, because I remember writing something about that. And, um, and you will see that uh, here's the solver. We initialize the solver. We add this, the constraints that we saw before. You see this, add the literals, so minus die shirt at zero. So the same thing that we did before, right? So the, the literals one by one, 
literals one by one, zero to terminate, literals one by one, to zero to terminate. Now we're gonna solve. We're gonna make sure that the solution is 10, which is satisfiable. And now we print satisfiable, you know, print the value of shirt, print the value of tie, and, and, and the line. And now we're gonna assume that the, the tie and shirt, you see, we're gonna assume uh, solver the tie and the shirt. We're gonna solve. The result is unsatisfiable. There's no such solution. And we said, hey, it failed. And it, uh, we, 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 um, we basically release the solver and return. So this is the, um, a, a very easy sort of uh, use of, of, uh, of this uh, IPES here. Uh, API programmatic interface. You will use this if you want to, if you want to uh, uh, use SAT solvers because the most efficient way of using SAT solvers is through this interface. If you start using SAT solvers through uh, uh, the, the, the command line, you're gonna bump into speed because you will have to read up the, the file every time. You would have, it's also not very, like not a very convenient way of using a SAT server from within uh, a system because you have to now start a new thread, you have to run this executable, check the output, it's a pain. Using it this way is much more efficient and this is what we do, for example, when we do any kind of higher level constraint, um, for example, counting, which uh, has a bunch of higher level constraints, we use effectively an interface just like this. All right, so now let's talk about this magical search that, we have, that I haven't yet explained. Um, so it all started with something called DP, and then like we went into DPLL, and then we'll go into CDCL. But let's start with, the, with this Davis-Putnam uh, procedure, which is effectively a, a, originally a res resolution-based system. It's actually not a search system. I'll explain in a second. And then the second one was DPLLT, which basically um, tr did a trade-off between memory usage and, and time. And basically this DP version kept on eliminating variables, I'll explain that in a second, just from the top to the bottom, and it tries to derive uh, uh, the empty close. Of course, the empty close means it's unsatisfiable. And the, uh, this second version, so the DPLLT, basically does a, a, a branching version of this. Instead of trying to uh, incrementally uh, eliminate the variables from the, from the formula and try to derive the empty close, it, um, it just does a case-by-case -case analysis, like what would happen if x is zero, what would happen if x is one, so now we have two, and then, of course, we can do this with y underneath, etc. cetera. So uh, let me just jump into here. So this is um, DPLL, where we do a decision at the, bo at the top, and then we do another decision, and then we reach some, some point at the bo here down, which, is, which may or may not be unsatisfiable. Then we're gonna go back and try this, not go back, down this. Just notice that actually I can pick another decision. Like once I'm finished with this branch, you see that here I, the A, B, and C is the order. But here it's A, C, and B the order. So the order doesn't, it's not, it's not, doesn't, it doesn't matter which order I pick once I'm in a, in a, in a, in a new branch. But within the same branch, of course, I cannot just, you know, randomly choose an order here. Anyway. Um, the, the DP procedure, so the, the, the resolution-based procedure, just does a very simple system where if the formula you know, is, is empty, then we're satisfiable. There's nothing to satisfy, we're done. Uh, if it contains the empty close, then it's unsatisfiable. Otherwise, pick a variable, add the resolvance on x uh, on this variable, and then remo remove the closes that contain x or not x, and start again. Right? And eventually all the variables will disappear and I'm done. The problem here is that this can be, this, 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 this issue here, this add or resolvance on x, this can actually be exponential in if, if, you, if, if, the, if the formula is, is, is of a specific type. Um, and if, for example, if it's all this XOR stuff, you will realize very quickly that this will just blow up and will never fit into your memory. So of course the next idea was like, why? well, instead of adi adding all the resolvents, we're just gonna branch left and right, branch left and right, and eventually we have searched through all the search space. There's nothing left. So here, let's, let's talk about this. Like, so I was talking about uh, like doing the, uh, the, 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 the resolvents. So bounded variable elimination is, is a version of this uh, resolvent thing, except that we bound it in the sense that we don't always resolve them. 
but the only way to resolve version is actually very easy. So this is your, 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 your set of clauses here. So some of them contain not X, you see like three of them contain not X and two of them contain X. And now we're going to resolve everything with everything. So we resolve like not X, so one with five, for example, you will see that you get A or D because the X obviously drops out and you get A and D. So like let's say X or not A or not B, if you resolve that, with um, not X or C, then you get C, the X drops out, not A, and B, right? So that's what you get here. And you see that actually this is um, one, two, three, four closes, and this is actually five closes. So now we, are less, we have actually less closes and one less variable. So this sounds like a win-win. But of course this can happen that this complete uh, resolution on, on X on the left-hand side can, can result in many, many, many more closes on the right-hand side, right? So if there were like 10 here on the, in, from, from not X and, and 10 here from X, then you can actually have 100 on the other side, right? So, you know, you, you, got, you, you started with 20 and now you ended with 100. Imagine if you do this with every variable, of course, it's just going to go crazy. It's not, you're never going to fit that into memory. So that was the original DP procedure that, that I explained here, right? So this is add all resolvents on X. That's the thing that we did here, right? Except that here we got lucky. The resolvent is actually less than the original. And this bounded variable animation actually was a ma massive, massive leap forward in 2005. So without this, we would be stuck. Back, we would be back in the Stone Age, effectively. Because this made it possible to solve many, many more instances because it turns out that if you do this as a pre-processing step, so remember the, the encoding, simplifying, and search? So this is squarely in the simplifying part. Um, if you do this as a form of simplification, of course you try every single variable, which are the ones that I can, I can, I can eliminate and still have less closes than I started with, like it's a win-win. I got one less close and one less variable in this case. Like, that sounds good to me. Um, actually, this has lately been even improved by slightly unbounded. So you're allowed to grow a little bit. So you're allowed to grow a few more closes. We can do a trade-off between a few more closes and one variable less. So sometimes it still grows the CNF, but with less variables. And a relatively new thing is this bounded variable addition, which is basically adding variables to remove closes. It's a very interesting sort of uh, idea. The really hard part is how to do it, but um, effectively, here is a set of closes. I'm not going to go through it. Uh, we could, but I think it's not worth your time. So here's a set of input closes uh, that only has a, 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 D, and a, B, C, D, and E inside. And on the right-hand side, you see that we actually have X as well, not just A, B, C, and C, D, and E, but we have less closes. You see that we started with a six and we ended up with five. Even if you do the resolution, so if you actually reverse this thing and you go back here, you take these, you go back here, you'll get this. So now it's sort of like flipping the whole thing around and adding a variable to remove closes, yes? So in the, the bounded variable elimination, so is, is there a simple way of figuring out whether resolving with respect to one variable is going to lead to a reduction or? Simple is a good question. Um, there. You can use good, good data structures to help you do this. So the question was, how easy it is to figure out that you know, this is going to lead to something less, right? Because you need to figure it out for every single variable, actually. And the way we do it is we actually simulate it. So if you have a look at all the, uh, the SAT solvers currently, is that we actually simulate. And then you know, we start resolving and like, oh, wait, now we're more, you know, like abort, abort, you know, go back and, and start again. And we, the way we do it is that we also order the, 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 the way we're going to uh, start resolving because the order matters. If you think about it, if you start resolving X here, you know, and now you decide, oh, well, I'm going to now do the, the resolvent on D, you know, now you have just changed the, the resolvents for D, right? So it, the, it's not, it's not, it's, it's, it's actually the order really matters. Um, you, you do this to fix, you never do this to fix points. So, you know, it really is going to make a difference. And, and even if you did this to fixed point, I, I believe it's, it would make a difference. So the point is that uh, we actually order the, uh, the, the variables um, to, uh, to, to start with the ones that have very few occurrences. So if X only occurs twice, most likely I can eliminate it 
and it will not grow. If it, if it, uh, if it occurs a thousand times, like imagine now I have to do, a, you know, like maybe up to 500 resolutions, you know, or I mean, yeah, so like tons and tons of resolutions that I have to do here to, uh, to figure out if I can really eliminate them. Not, like actually, so if it's 100 times, then it's like up to, if it's uh, in there 100 times, then I might, might need to do up to 50 squared resolutions to, um, to, to see, you know, if it's, if it's good or not. And I would actually never even do it. So there's some heuristics that just says, oh, well, this, 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 this variable is inside uh, the closes so often that there's no point in trying. Um, yes? So, uh, all of the, most of this uh, uh, method, it seems like there is a trade-off that, uh, in all of these methods, it seems like there is a trade-off that the point is to try to minimize either the number of uh, variables or the number of clauses. But as you indicated below, before uh, minimizing the number of variables hardly solves the problem if, if there is a, an uh, unsatisfiability uh, reason for the, because of the formula itself. So uh, are there any other reasons to perform this other than minimization? Yes, so the, the question is correct. Like I was saying, well, the number of variables doesn't matter. Uh, well, it turns out in the complexity of solving the problem on its own, it doesn't, but, the problem, but, but all the heuristics, you know, uh, use a lot, uh, they, they, they make, it makes a big difference that the heuristics are um, not, let's say if you do picking of variables, when you do branching, okay, so when you do branching here, it, move. It matters which, which variable you're going to branch on, for example. And that's a heuristic that we use. And the thing is, if you have fewer variables, then less mistakes you can make in, in, in branching, right? And the more information you will have on each variable, because what we do is we track how branching decisions affect our performance. And then we're going to readjust our branching to, to, um, to, 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 for a better performance. And ha having less variables, um, makes these heuristics a lot better. And also, uh, in terms of, of um, the usage of the memory, so what happens is that um, we use data structures that are specifically optimized for, for cache locality. And if you have a lot of variables, then you will be resolving pointers all over the place all the time. So we're jumping around a lot in memory. And it won't actually be like, the order, or like the ordo, ordo number of options, you know, like, uh, like uh, maybe the ordo, you know, number of steps you'll be taking is the same, but the, um, but the, uh, the, the, the time it takes to those, those steps will take you longer because of the number of variables that are inside. I'll, maybe I'll have time to talk about this two watch literal scheme, and we effectively have a form of occurrence list. It's a kind of a optimized occurrence list. So for every single very literal, actually, we have a, a, sec, a separate list, like a, 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 a bunch of pointers. And you'll have to jump to all these things. So if the less variables you have, the more compact all your problem is inside this data structure, this particular data structure. And then it means that you're going to jump, you, you're going to have a higher chance of uh, whenever trying to branch on a variable or, the, or, or propagate a variable. So whenever you're trying to do an operation, it will take you less time to do it because um, your data structures are going to be more compact because there's going to be less variables. So that's the answer. It's actually more, less to do with algorithmic sort of thing and more to do with just practical ways how many memory hierarchies work. So when it comes to start solving, you, it's one of these weird areas, and that's one of the things I like about it. Maybe this wasn't very clear, but let me, maybe this is actually a good question to, to talk about this for some while. So start solving is really weird because you have this like really high, you know, like high level theoretical concepts like proof complexity, which will bound your, your start solver. Like if the problem is symmetric, for example, then you, you're more or less screwed. You know, like you'll never be able to do this thing. You'll, you'll never be able to, sort, to, to, resolve, to, to prove unsatisfiability because you know, the, the proof would take you billions of years just to write down. Whereas, whereas at the same time, you have to optimize for cache hierarchy of, of current CPUs, which is like very strange because most research is either one or the other. You know, either you want to do this kind of very optimized, you know, uh, code that really takes advantage of all the bits and pieces of modern uh, CPUs to uh, speed up the, uh, the, the computation, 
or you do this kind of very high level work where all you think about is proof complexity and, 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 and width and all this kind of graph width and um, theoretical concepts effectively. But SAT sort of like does the whole, the whole thing, you know, from A to Z. And uh, I mean, I like more the more practical stuff, but you'll see that actually the proof thing is kind of interesting and these higher level concepts are interesting. But in this case, we actually jumped into the, uh, the more low level concepts where it really is the memory hierarchy that we have to deal with and the cache. Basically, just cache misses are really expensive. And if you have them more tight in the memory, uh, less variables means it's going to be more tight. You will see the data structure we use. It's more tight, so we have a uh, better chance of hitting the cache. So, and, and better chance of hitting the cache sounds not so interesting, except that you realize that the modern cache is, uh, modern CPUs run so extremely fast that if something is not in the cache, then you might have to wait 100 clock cycles or more to get the data into the cache. So imagine if I could be 100 times faster. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. Like imagine if somebody going on a, on a highway and it's like you're going with like 100 and somebody goes that by by 10,000 kilometers an hour and you're like, what the hell just happened? And, and that's basically the difference, you know? And of course people are like, you know, this is so much faster. Well, yes, you know, like if you got everything in cash, it's a lot faster. And uh, yeah, all right. So um, this is the DPLL procedure. So this is more or less the same as before. If you think about it, like you, you, you start the same way, you see? But you actually simplify with the variable that you pick. So you say, I'm going to pick x, you know, x is equal to true, let's say, and I'm going to put x is equal to true, simplify the formula, try again, and do this recursively. And a simplify the formula is what we call BCP, which is a Boolean constraint propagation, where you just uh, substitute into the formula, you know, variable x is equal to zero and see what happens. Like, of course, if there's a literal, uh, there's a close that comes up that, you know, y is equal to zero, then you also put y is equal to zero and simplify and then do this until fixed point, this is called BCP. And then once you've simplified everything and you're still not solved, like, okay, well, let's pick another variable, I don't know, uh, V10, and then you said V10 is equal to zero, let's see what happens. And then you do this recursively and eventually you'll find a solution. So this is a very simple search procedure. This is not what SAT solvers do, but not very far off, actually. Um, so here's one. I'm just going to talk a little bit about, about this particular uh, uh, one here. So you see that we took a decision A is equal to uh, true and B is equal to true, and now BCP kicks in, which is to say, is A, A B is equal to true and B is equal to true, then this close here at the top, the blue one, will force C to be zero because this close can only be true if the, the C is zero. You see that? Um, yeah, so one thing that I want to talk about this is that um, there is different types of SAT solvers and one of them is called look ahead, which isn't so popular anymore, but it's actually a very interesting solver and it does just that. So it does exactly this, what you see here. And it obviously has very smart heuristics to pick the decision variable because it makes a big difference what decision variable you pick. And it does a lots of pre-processing on every, every branch. So for example, it takes A is equal to one here, it will do tons of pre-processing, so lo tons of like, logic on this particular node in the graph to see uh, what can be simplified. And then of course it will then try all the different kind of decisions that it could make and pick the one that's the best. And that does this eventually exhausting the decision tree. Of course, some of the things will just stop working. Like it might, it might be that B is equal, if you set B is equal to zero here, it immediately stops because the preprocessing tells you that this is an empty formula. Uh, sorry, this formula contains an empty uh, close. And then you're like, okay, well, there's nothing there. There's no solution there. And it, of course, it will also stop if it finds a solution at any point. So this is a, what's called a look ahead solver. It, it's kind of dumb, but actually it's very smart. It's just smart in different ways and we are dumb in, in different ways. It's a, it's a different trade-off. Uh, SAS servers do very little, very little pre-processing in every single uh, node in this graph. Basically, they're completely blind at every single node, but they do it really, really fast. The look at servers like, reverse this and basically say, well, I'm going to be really slow, but I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to branch on the right variables every single time. Whereas the SAT server is like, well, it was a bad, bad branch, who cares? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to reverse all of this and it's going to be quick. So it's a, it's a different trade-off. But I'm not going to talk about look-ahead solvers. This is about um, uh, CDCL solvers. Uh, this talk is about CDCL solvers and, um, and CDCLT. Right. Um, so 
The CDCL concept was originally implemented in the context of GRASP and um, the solver. And it is basically learning what's called uh, a no good, but um, in a smart way. So the no good is, you, you, let's say that you went down here, you did two decisions here. A is equal to one, B is equal to one. So the original no good, actually this is by Stallman, funnily enough, this is the only paper he ever wrote, is uh, if, if you took two decisions, A is equal to one, B is equal to one, and it failed, like, you know, it doesn't work, well then obviously the, you can add the close, not, not A or not B, right? Because that's, it, it, the two together cannot work, right? So you, you can add this close, and this is what's called a no good, and basically you just add these closes on every single, like when you do, go down a decision and things fail, you add the no good. And this just, what we nowadays call actually the decision close, because in SaaS solvers we don't use this too often, but it's, they started being used again. So it's uh, one of those magical things about SAT, like people forget things you know, 10 years ago and then they come back to it and like, ah, oh, it actually works, let's do it again. So I actually use this, um, this no good idea when the decision, uh, number of decisions that I've taken is very few, like let's say three or four, and it failed, then of course you can just add the close that negates all those uh, decisions as a close and say, well, you know, that, that set of decisions is definitely wrong, so I can, I, can, I can cut the search space next time by adding this, this uh, no good. And uh, instead of doing no goods, though, normally you do, we do something called first uni unique in implication points, first UIP. I will actually not talk about it in this lecture. Uh, I decided not to because it's quite a, quite a, it just confuses everyone. And in the end of the day, it's not that, important to, um, to understand how SAT solvers work. Um, you can read about it in different blogs and in different papers, um, and it's, it co would confuse you more than it would help you. But the point is of first unique implication point is that you can actually resolve the final clauses that, that took part in, the, in, in, this, in this conflict. So if you have a look at this conflict, this conflict was two closes took part of it. This one here at the top, because it forced the, this, this um, uh, propagation of the minus C, so the, uh, sorry, of the, yeah, of the minus C, so the C is equal to zero was forced by this close at the top, because A was one and B was one, and so not C must have been set. And then the other close that took part in this, in this, in this issue here, that there's no more solutions here, is this other clause, which basically says not A, not B, and not, uh, or C, and that's, you know, that's not possible, because if you have a look at that, not A, so that's zero, not B, that's zero, and C, that's also zero. Okay, so this clause is, is, is falsified. Something is wrong. We need to do something about it. And now the two clauses that took part in this are the, the blue and the red one, and if you resolve them over C, what you suddenly get is not A or not B, and basically the first UIP does a magical thing that takes into account all the clauses that took, took part in this conflict, resolves them, um, of course you can resolve them in different orders and you can resolve them at different point, um, and this is the reason why it's called first unique implication point, because that tells you at, at what, how do you, when do you stop resolving them, basically when do you stop the resolution on the clauses, and you save that clause as a memory of this conflict that you had here. So never to go back to that same place again, to ban that part of the search space. Let me actually, I, yeah, so there's some things that I would talk about, but I wanna go here first. So this is, a, this is a, an example uh, a search tree, and what happens here is that the solver starts right up there. It does all these branches. You see these, these little branches that are going left, 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 and there's like this thing, that's the BCP, that's the Boolean constraint propagation. Where, where I'm substituting the, literal, the variables into the closes and things are popping out of it. And then there's more and more and more branches, and then I go down here at the very bottom, is, you see there's one more branch, and then there's a propagation all the way down here, and this thing here at the very bottom, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the, the learned close. So that's the, the, the resolvent of all the, the, the closes that were, that were leading to this place, to remember never to go back to the same place again. And what we're gonna do is we just go back and of course we flip, the, we flip the decision and then we go again and we flip the decision and things don't work out and don't work out and don't work out and actually here we go back all the way to the very first decision right there and we, uh, 
We flip that one, and now we're going to scroll right all the way here, all the way here. We go flip, 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 and eventually that's the solution right there. So that's, that's one visualized way of visualizing uh, a SAT solver. Now, maybe what you want to take away from this, other than the pretty graphics, is, is we're missing a chunk here. We're completely mixing this chunk. So what some, so, I mean, this is like a, a blow up here, but like you see that there's nothing here? Like somehow we early abort here? You see these, these, all these places we early abort? We don't go all the way down here. We, we early abort right up there. And the reason why we early abort is that the, the closes, of course, you know, that we start uh, uh, um, replacing the variables inside this thing uh, that, uh, with, with the values that we know, and there was, a, there was an empty close that popped up. And this is basically the difference between something like a brute force engine that you know, evaluates the function all the way to the top every time. So it starts at the beginning, you know, puts the, all the values in, you know, evaluates it to the, to the end, oh, it's not good, let's go back up, you know, try the other combination. And of course, there's usually two to the power of n combinations because it's a brute force algorithm, and you try again, and you can try again, and you try again. And basically, you'd have like a massive black box here, right? That's what you'd have. Because you try, you do everything, right? But here what's happening is that you sort of keep track of where you are and there's quite a lot of update you know, that you have to do, but you skip a good chunk of the search space. You completely skip that part of the search space. So this is the difference between a SAT solver and, for example, when you try to do Bitcoin mining and you do this, I don't know if you know how it works, so you have to, uh, basically it goes through every combination of, of an input uh, to a hash function and, and verifies if the output is, matches a certain pattern. And if it doesn't, then it goes from the beginning and it's just like, okay, well, then let's try another combination. It tries another combination, goes to the end, well, they're not good, let's go back. And it does this whole thing, like it's really stupid, but if you think about it, it's a trade-off because you don't have to do all this data structures and understanding where you are and, and deriving conflicts and all these like smart things you don't have to do, right? Instead, you can just like put it into a, 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 a let's say, a graphics uh, a GPU, a GPGPU system, and like evaluate it on like, I don't know, a thousand stream cores at the same time in parallel, you know, bit sliced if you're fun, if you love doing that sort of stuff. And then it's really fast. But it's, smart. it's not very smart. It will not early abort. It will go all the way to the end every time, you know, sees if it doesn't match the pattern, and it goes back to the beginning, tries a different combination, and does this all the time. So that's kind of the difference between a SAT solver and, a, and these, these brute force engines. And one of them goes to the whole damn search space, like from the beginning to the end, without thinking. But of course, not thinking is, is an advantage. It means that you, know, you, you don't have to do all these data structures and you, you don't have to do all this checking. You just go boom, you know? Uh, but sometimes that works really well, for example, for compact problems in cryptography, you know, because it only has the number of variables is, let's say, you know, 50 or 80, and then you can do this. But here, if you have you know, thousands of variables, you cannot possibly do that because it will never finish. So now you have to do some different search algorithm. So maybe we won't go through all of this because we'll be tight on time. So, okay, so this is where we were, uh, and I explained how this, this one in particular worked. Um, this is basically just the same thing, and we keep on deriving these new, new closes that are being, uh, being generated. We can step through it. It's not such a big deal. So here, you know, these two gets resolved, and you learn the resolvent of those two, those two closes. And now you go back up, and you're going to take a decision of one, A is equal to 1 again. And now suddenly uh, B propagates, because we use this, this close to propagate B. You see that A is equal to 1. We replace A in here. You know, B0 is set. And then once A is 1 and B is 0, then suddenly, you know, this one, uh, the green one here, is propagating because A is 1, so this not A is 0, B is 0, so this is 0, which means that not C propagates, so C is equal to 0. But suddenly, we reach again a conflict because now we have A is 1, B is 0, C is 0, but that means that this is 0, 0, 0. So now all these closes were part of the, the, the conflict. Right? All, the, all the colored closes are part of this conflict. And we're going to derive a new close, uh, which is going to be C. And then now we're going to do this the same thing again. And if we keep on doing this, and eventually we will learn the empty close, and we're done. And this is how this particular uh, one works. And the, the coloring of these different closes is basically just trying to match. You see the, uh, the different, why the different things happen. And if you start resolving them, you'll eventually arrive at the empty of the empty close. Uh, I'll not have time for this, and neither for this. What I will talk about instead is something called back jumping, which is um, 
What you do is that when you derive the conflict and you derive a close, a resolvent of all the closes that, not all, but some of the closes that led to this particular conflict, um, then sometimes that close will actually be implying that not only the last decision you made was wrong, but actually a decision previous to it was wrong. So it can actually imp uh, it say something stronger than just, hey, reverse the previous decision, which was the DPLL procedure. I don't know if you remember, you just go left and right, left and right, left and right, like a full search. Here you can actually derive a, a, a conflict that says the entire branch here, here is wrong. Don't bother with it. You can go back all the way to, to reversing X. So we jump over this part. You see the, the, the one that's cut here with the blue line is completely cut. And this is called back jumping. So when you do uh, this uh, resolution based um, derivation of uh, the, basically the essence of why you had a conflict, why things didn't work out, uh, you can actually, uh, it can happen that you don't, you can do more than just reversing the last decision. You can reverse this decision, or you can even reverse a, fur a decision further up the chain. All right. And there are different, there's uh, heuristics for picking, of course, the variables. Uh, one that is very well known and it's always used nowadays is what's called uh, EVSIT, so um, uh, uh, exponential visit, uh, which is um, basically tracking which variables appear in these conflicts. So it turns out these conflicts are a really good uh, indicator for which variables are playing a role in your search and which of the variables are most likely to be problematic because they are the ones that you want to search on, uh, want to branch on first. And so basically you do a, a, a search that is going to be focused on variables that are recently in derived closes. And the, the emphasis here is recently and of course, the question is how recently? Do you want like the last variable that was that was that appeared? Would you want that? And that's called the VMTF uh, variable move to front strategy, where you just like, oh, this was the last variable that you saw. Well, let's move it to the front. That's the next thing we're going to branch on if it's available. I mean, if it, it's not available, I cannot branch on it because it's already set. Then okay. But if it is available, I'm going to branch on it first. So that's like basically this exponential, this this visits, this uh, this uh, variable branching strategy with uh, like a crazy like a crazy heuristic where like that's the last variable you saw, poof, that's the one that I'm going to branch on that one. And a more like sort of maybe a, a more sane or maybe a, a, I wouldn't, I, it's not a matter of sanity actually, it's a matter of, of uh, whether it works or not. Uh, what you do is that you basically assign scores to, um, to variables and uh, add this score to a variable if you recently saw it. And you just keep on adding this score every time so that's, that's just linear, you know, you just add, the very, add, add this score every time. Or you can do an exponential and you say, well, the, you know, if I, if, I, um, if I see this variable, then I add this score and every other score I, I make sh smaller by a factor of 0 0.8. And then I, the next variable I, I see again in the conflict, I add, you know, the same score to it and make everybody else 0 0.8, you know, uh, the, the, the score of it 0 0.8 times smaller. And you do this all the time. And then, obviously, the more recent something is, the more likely you're going to pick next time because it's just an order. It's like a heap, you know? It's a, the data structure is actually a heap. And then you, you, uh, you keep on picking the ones that you most like, most so most recently. I mean, if you saw a variable 10 times recently and not the last time, then you're still going to pick it. Whereas the variable moves to front strategy, which is just, you know, you saw it recently, that's it, that's the one we're going to pick. It doesn't, like, the, 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 the history is completely erased of, like, what you saw before. It's just what happened just right now. And actually before all of this, and I'm sure so you, the, the, at, the, at the top you see that actually it used to be uh, something that, that didn't actually deal with variables, instead it dealt that with uh, literals, but uh, Miniset came in and basically said, well, all this uh, 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 literal-based decision heuristic, which doesn't uh, branch based on a variable, but be, uh, branch, uh, based, uh, branches based on the score of a literal, uh, was effectively completely replaced with this variable-based uh, decision heuristic, and everybody's now using variable-based decision heuristics. So they, they, um, they say, okay, I'm going to branch on V, variable V, and then I'm going to set it to some value. And the, uh, the value that we're going to set to, for example, in Minisat is zero. It's a, it's a very good heuristic, it's zero. <laughs> uh, the answer is always zero. So basically, uh, it wants to branch on V, we're going to set V to zero. 
And uh, if it doesn't work out, of course, it's going to flip it to 1. I mean, it's not like it's never going to set it to 1. But when it first sets it, it's going to set it to 0. And uh, then that was changed. And now it's something called uh, polarity caching, where if you last time you branched on it, your first time you branch it, you set it to 0. And then when, it, when, it, when you, then the variable gets assigned, for example, it gets assigned to 1, the la then next time you need to branch on it, you're going to set it to 1. But if, you, if last time it was set to 0, then you're going to branch it to 0. So you just the last same value of the variable is the one that we're going to branch on. This is called polarity caching, and it works really, really well, because it means that every time you, uh, you, uh, you, you search, you're going to find yourself in the place that you were last time, more or less. Except that, of course, the set of decisions might be different. Like, you, you might have started, the, the decision order might have been different, because, of course, the, the, the heuristic that, 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 that I talked about here, you know, might be different at a different time, in the point in time. So the activity of variables, the, the recentness of variable the, in, in, in the queue might be different. And so it might be the order of, of branching is different, but you arrive at the, the same point in the search space. Right. And I mean, of course, here's the look ahead, oh, shit, sorry. The look ahead solver thing that I, I, I mentioned where, of course, the, the what variables do you decide on is substantially different the way it does the decision. It doesn't do a queue or some heap or some scores. It actually individually checks every single variable that it possibly could check and could branch on and evaluates how good it is. It's extremely expensive. So every single branch is going to take you minutes or something. I mean, I mean, if it's a really large problem. But it's also you know, correct. It's very fast. It's, it's, it's going to branch the right way. And there are some systems that actually do uh, um, uh, a version of the two, so co doing uh, both at the same time, you do like very slow and, sna and, 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 and expensive decision at the top of your search tree, and then you do really, really quick at the bottom. So you basically do one type of solver at the top and a different type of solver at the bottom. Right. I'm not going to talk about this. This is the basic CDCL loop. So basically, this is how most SAT solvers uh, work uh, when they talk about when we talk about CDCL. So first, we're going to check if it's unsatisfiable. If it's unsatisfiable, you know, off we go. We're done. Um, if not, then we're going to propagate. We're going to uh, replace all the values, the current values, into all the closes and see if anything pops out. You know, if there's a close that suddenly becomes uh, a is equal to zero, then you know we set a is equal to zero and we do this to fixed point. So that's called propagation. And then if we're satisfied, all the closes are satisfied, then we're done. If not, we're going to decide. That's it. It's quite easy. That's the good thing. And of course, if your propagation didn't work, so you, when you were propagating, your, you were replacing the things, and you came out with, a, with, a, with an empty close. So you were replacing the variables with the current assignment, and, and it turns out that you know, a close is not satisfied. Then you do this analysis. Then you do this, this magical analysis to resolve the closes together to, um, to find a, a, com a conflict close that describes why you ended up in this place. And this is the, the graph that I just showed you where it does exactly that. And I think I'm going to have maybe two more slides, and then we can all enjoy our little break. Um, first is reducing learned closes. So you, you derive all these, and you do the, all this analysis, and you get all these closes that you know, explain why you ended up in this place, and it's not a great place to be. Um, because it means that now you, you grow your set of closes all the time. Every single time you do a conflict, you're gonna, you have one more, one more close. Right? And uh, imagine that modern SAT solvers easily do millions of conflicts. And you don't want to add a million closes to your database, your close database, because that's just going to slow you down. So you have to reduce them, and you have to remove some of them. And there are different heuristics for removing them. Uh, some of them used to be like, well, if it's short, we're going to keep it. If it's long, we're not going to keep it. Uh, better is that you, you use different kind of heuristics, like how active is this close? Like, is it being used? Is it actually useful? Like, am I doing anything with this close, or is it just there and doing nothing, using the memory? And then this LBD is sort of a new heuristic, sort of, because it's, it's 10 years old at this point. <laughs> And, and it's, uh, it's computing a static value that um, based on the, uh, the resolutions that you made and the decision that you're at in your search tree. And um, if this static value is smaller than a certain value, then you keep it. And if not, then you throw it away eventually. 
And then Kuldeep and, uh, and, and, and Raghav and myself have been working on, uh, on one that actually computes, auto-computes this uh, heuristic based on machine learning and proof traces and a bunch of other things um, to, um, to basically derive a heuristic uh, based on uh, the actual running of the SAT solver. And then finally, the last little ingredient into our uh, SAT soup is what's called restarts, where you, uh, when you have been searching for a while, you can actually say, well, let's abandon this search part and start completely new, start again. Now the thing, if, if you think about it, if you do this with DPLL, so the original search algorithm where you go left, right, left, right, left, right, if you start from the beginning, what, like, I mean, you just threw away all the work that you, you ever did, right? You start from the beginning, left, right, left, right, like, okay, so I have to do again everything from the beginning because I have no idea. This is a, the, the DPLL search procedure is a, is, is a search procedure that just does all the way, and the way it derives unsatisfiability is that I have searched all the search space. There's nothing there, you know? Now I'm done. But here, we don't actually do that. What we do instead is we keep these learn clauses as memories for the for the things that didn't work out. And actually the learn clauses are the key. The search is just directing us to the learn clauses. So I have this, uh, this, I mean, you can look at set solvers as search directed resolution systems. Where basically all you're doing is you're pretending to be searching, but actually what you're doing is, is looking for the, the resolvents, the little things at the bottom. So you're just fishing for this stuff at the bottom here. That's what you're really looking for. That's your, your memory of a place that you couldn't go back to because you shouldn't go back to because there's nothing there. That, that part of the search space is empty. This encodes this, basically. And, and these are resolvents, so you're effectively building a, a, a proof of unsatisfiability through these little memories of the things that didn't work out. And that's the reason why you can restart, because you can, it doesn't matter where we were. You know, we can just restart again, do the, do the search again, do more resolutions, do, do more of these memories, the little, little memory pieces that you know, didn't work out, and eventually, through these little uh, uh, resolvents, these, these conflict clauses, we're going to build a proof. So the whole thing is reversed. It, it looks like it's doing a search, but, but actually it's doing a it's actually doing a, 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 a building a proof. And it's even building a proof when it's actually finding a satisfying assignment because it finds a satisfying assignment here, but what it actually did was build a proof that said, hey, all the other places, don't bother a bit. There's nothing there. I'm going to build a proof that there's nothing there and eventually hope that the search will find the one solution that does exist. And if there is no solution, then you, know, you just hope that the, 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 the resolution proof will just be good enough. We'll get there. So the whole thing with the search is actually uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know it's the the, the 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 trick that the devil pulled because it looks like you know that's it's, it's to, to distract you into search but it's actually the it's it is the proof that we are doing that's the that's the that's the core of all self solving in a in a sense and if the in, and if the if the proof that you're building is not is um, is not possible to build because you can actually, in some cases, for example, for the pigeon hill principle, you can prove that the, the proof itself is extremely large, then you will know that this thing will never finish. It will actually never finish. I mean, it will finish, you know, theoretically speaking, but you might, you know, the sun might go into a white, white dwarf and, you know, you'll still be waiting for the thing to finish. And that's when you realize, okay, it really is the proof. It's not the search. The, it's, it's just a search directed proof engine. And that's basically where we're going to pick up next in, uh, in this talk.